Well, good day. My name's Tony Peacock. Uh, I'm Deputy Chair of uh, the Academy of Technology and Engineering's Innovation and Industry Forum. Uh, as we gather for this meeting from different places around Australia, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. Today, I'm joining you from Ngunnawal country in Canberra. I pay respects to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. As I said, I'm Tony Peacock. I'm involved in uh, commercialise uh, commercial development of technology uh, from a very diverse range uh, of things, uh, from pork, and I mean the meat, through antibiotic resistance, uh, hand sanitizers, uh, it's doxel.com, uh, just doxel.com, uh, terrific one, uh, kelp even, and as a Churchill fellow a few years ago, I've studied how technology is developed between companies and universities in the USA, the UK, Germany and Singapore, as well as Australia. And with the Academy of uh, uh, the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, I've been in discussions around the world in Japan, Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Netherlands and France, at least on these issues. And I've got to say, I get very upset when people just quote as dogma that Australians are hopeless at commercialising technology. That is just not true. Get that out of your mind. Uh, Australians are very, very good at commercialising technology. And today we've got one sample uh, in the area of hearing technology. Not only you'll all know uh, cochlear, but you may not know all the stories about the development of uh, cochlear, which I think is worth over $14 billion uh, today with as, as the world leading um, company, but also around the whole hearing uh, area in Australia. And uh, so I'm really delighted uh, that we're going to show it off. Um, this is the first seminar in a new series of seminars, uh, sharing those successful stories from scientists and technology technologists who've transla translated research into practical and, commu and commercial products. Uh, the series, as said, has been put together by the Academy of Technology and Engineering, which is also called ATSI. Uh, and the theme is technology, hearing technology. The format of the session is four very short talks, one after the other. Attendees are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the Q&A uh, via the Q&A function, not the chat function. Uh, put your questions into the Q&A function and we'll address them as a panel at the end of the thought forum. Uh, attendees are welcome to use the chat function to engage with each other throughout the session, uh, but make sure the questions come through the Q&A function. Um, we're also using closed captioning uh, for this seminar, which is appropriate given that it's on the topic of hearing technology and probably one in four to one in five Australians suffer from some form of hearing loss. Our first speaker is adjunct Professor Dimity Dorman. Dimity's a, a bionic woman. Uh, she's a speech pathologist and a researcher. In 1992, she established Hear and Say as a leading not-for-profit for deaf children learning to listen and speak, particularly those with surgically implanted hearing technology like the bionic ear. She's founder and chair of Bionics Queensland and is currently working to accelerate new bionic solutions to market for the benefit of people who, with previously untreatable medical problems like neurological, limb, sensory and organ conditions. And she's the chair of ATSI's Industry and Innovation Forum. Welcome, Dimity. Hello, how are you, Tony? Hello, everybody. And away you go, Dimity. Great, I'm very pleased to be talking here today in such illustrious company. And um, I'm looking forward to telling you all about my journey. Um, and what I learned about commercialisation along the way. Um, I started around 1991 um, foreseeing uh, and having a vision of what would happen if this cochlear implant or bionic ear that was coming in children, what it could do for the children with hearing loss that I was working with. And uh, I decided that um, the, the many children that I was seeing in my private practice, 
they did they did not have the means to keep paying private fees and so um, with that story of looking forward to seeing what the bionic ear could do to help us access children's brains by sound i decided to start a not-for-profit called hear and say on the 6th of july 1992 which is when we started with six children um, today the story is quite different and also there are a few things have been revealed on the way through. The first thing that I learned was that the people, the professionals working with children with hearing loss had traditionally never worked together until the first um, successful cochlear implant and the first um, idea that we might have something good here. Um, the second thing was is that we, we needed to work as a team of teams. In other words, there needs to be a lot of collaboration between the teams to make things really work so these kids could have the very best outcomes, kids with severe, profound or total hearing losses. And um, as I went along my way, nearly 30 years later, I've suddenly in the last 15 years realised that what we were looking at with the bionic ear was the first successfully commercialised neuromodulation device. Uh, a neuromodulation device which would interface with the brain and the nervous system and change it. In the case of children, change it forever. So um, the next thing that happened to me was that um, Bob Cowan came to see me and asked me if I would uh, allow Hear and Say to be become one of the Hearing Cooperative Research Centre members. And that was absolutely amazing. And I'm sure Bob's going to tell you a little bit about that later, but that really sparked my imagination for the wonders of science and what could be done if we all worked together as teams of teams. Um, I became a supporting party representative on the CRC board, a researcher collecting data and, and, and my growing team were also collecting data, starting with six children here and say has developed to over a thousand children um, at any one time. And um, I uh, eventually became a lead researcher in the last uh, tranche of the CRC. So that was a very successful time for Australia and hearing. Uh, we became world leaders because we had this vehicle called the CRC. We all worked together. We worked across state boundaries and it was highly successful. Many good research um, outcomes were had and many of these have been commercialized. Around 2013, I started to think, um, there are so many new bionics devices spinning out of the bionic ear. I wondered what else could be done and I could see people making the same mistakes as we, we made in the beginning of the bionic ear in children. So I started a national group called the Human Bionics Interface Alliance, um, which uh, has changed slowly until I realized that Queensland was being left behind. So in uh, around 2018, 2019, I started the uh, Bionics Queensland group. It's also an alliance and we have lots of um, amazing things to tell you about that. Uh, in between that, I was asked to become an ATSI fellow, which has, has really changed my life. And I've really enjoyed being chair of the Industry and Innovation Forum. And uh, I, I have thought it was a marvelous year this last year. Um, on the way, I also decided that I would teach myself how to commercialize because I knew how to set up a charity, but I didn't know really much about commercialization at all. So I, I started with a small hearing device, which um, has now got stuck with COVID interruptions on generation four. And um, who knows what might happen to that in the future. But I have to say that my learning curve has been huge. I wanted to tell you lastly about Bionics Queensland and what we've found. We've found that um, by partnering with many other people and running a challenge, run by our CEO, Dr. Robin Stokes. We've run a challenge that's gone, st first of all, throughout Queensland in 2020, and now in 2021, throughout Australia. And we've ended up with some amazing winners um, who are now being fast tracked on the way to their commercialization, including a bionic pancreas, a, bi a bionic larynx, and many other devices, which are so exciting. It's a wonderful place to be in. So what do I wish I had known before I started my commercialization journey? I wished I'd known 
the full process end to end because I didn't and I wished I'd learned that first. And the other thing that I've learned is the importance of staged government support and building that government interest and visibility to the government from the very earliest possible stage, which I have done. And uh, I've, I'm really looking forward to hearing the other speakers and seeing what else comes out of this session. Thank you, Tony. Thanks so much, Dimity. What a journey of lifelong learning. Um, yes. It's just brilliant. And uh, I should mention you've been awarded a, a Order of Australia uh, for your contributions in the area, which is so obvious um, there. Thanks so much for that. We'll come to questions. Don't forget to add your questions to the Q&A. Um, you, you can chat to each other through the chat uh, panel, but please use the Q&A to uh, throw up questions. I'm going to introduce our second speaker now, Professor Bob Cowan. Bob has led four successive cooperative research centres from uh, to, uh, 1992 through to 2019, uh, bringing together industry, universities, clinical services and professional associations involved in hearing healthcare. Through its commercial arm, Hear Works, Hearing CRC Translational Research has now returned over $20 million in commercial revenues, established two spin off companies, and enabled HearNet clinical studies and HearNet learning to continue as legacy in initiatives supporting hearing research and clinical healthcare in Australia. Bob, take it away. Well, thanks very much. Uh... Tony and Dimity, and I'd like to thank the Academy for this Innovation Nation webinar on hearing technology. Um, communication is the fundamental underpinning to our society, and I think there remains a clear and pressing need for Australia for better prevention and improved remediation of hearing loss in children, adults, and most importantly, in our aging elderly. I was extremely fortunate to join Graham Clark's team at the University of Melbourne in 1985 and to be part of the establishment of the University of Melbourne Cochlear Limited Partnership that's really helped Australia to become a powerhouse in implantable hearing technology. <clears throat> I think Australia was also fortunate indeed to have the insight of Professor Ralph Slatcher, who identified the need for an alternative avenue to the traditional NH and MRC and ARC investigator driven research programs. The Cooperative Research Centers program that Timothy mentioned um, was from the outset an industry and end user pulled program, which brought together larger cross sector consortiums that were needed to address complex problems like hearing loss in the community. And critically, to improve on the potential for innovation to complete the cycle and see technology put into commercial and clinical use. Building on that established Cochlear University Melbourne partnership, Australia was awarded, Australia awarded four hearing CRCs that operated from 1992 through 2019. From the outset, the CRCs were structured on a project management format with identified industry and clinical end users involved in the design of each project and an identified transition pathway at commencement. This was quite different than traditional academic research. We were fortunate to have the long-term support of Cochlear, Hearing Australia's National Acoustics Laboratories, the University of Melbourne, Macquarie University, and in particular service delivery organizations like Hear and Say, the Shepherd Center, the Ioneer Hospital's Cochlear Implant Clinic, and NextSense. And it's pleasing that those partnerships are now continuing beyond the CRC's term as the Hearing uh, HearNet Clinical Studies. Um, importantly, one of the things we learned is that, you know, outcomes don't always go to plan. And a key element of the CRCs was the flexibility to work with members to assess and revise projects as they progressed on a monthly basis. That's an industry paradigm that doesn't always sit well with academics. Now, that flexibility also had to extend to translation. And the hearing CRC employed multiple models and formats, including licenses, direct sales, spin-offs, IP acquisitions, and collaborative development agreements to ensure that technology reached the actual end users, the children and adults with hearing loss. Clearly, hearing CRC was reliant on its industry and clinical service partners to ensure that the technology was delivered in a fit-for-use mode. For something to be used, clinicians have to know about it. 
So translation also extended to HearNet Learning, a continuing professional development program that we established to allow outcomes in new technology or clinical services to be delivered directly as learning modules for clinical professionals. And that brings me to my key point, which is the role of education, both postgraduate and professional in translational research. I've always been mystified that while we focus on training of our early career researchers to actually conduct scientifically valid and rigorous research, we somehow assume that they'll acquire people and project management skills that'll enable them to run larger scale projects without any dedicated training at all. In the sphere of industry research collaboration, again, the concept appears to be that simply having a contract with an industry partner somehow conveys an understanding about scalability and manufacturability of technology and how this needs to be packaged. So it was interesting, you know, Dimity's comment, I agree totally with that. Um, those aren't necessarily things that are readily identifiable uh, to academics. In my own case, I felt compelled to complete an MBA early on in my first CRC to gain new skills and a critical vocabulary to interface with uh, industry. In the hearing CRC, one of our key foci was on value-added training for our 72 PhDs and 40-odd early career project leaders. In essence, teaching them project management skills, including people and budget management through on-the-job training, leading their projects. You know, this was to me a really key element in the success of the hearing CRC. And it's pleasing that many of these scientists and clinicians have gone on to careers in academic, academia, industry, and in clinical work. Um, things are changing, actually, though. It's heartening to see that many universities now focus on the three-minute pitch and presentation skills in pH training that are, you know, a cornerstone of, of you know, industry um, translation. My strong belief is that inclusion of project and people management training for early career researchers would result in better outcomes. And this is really what I wish I'd known early on in the process, not acquired during that process. I think this is something that ATSCI could take a leading role in, and it's really pleasing to see this innovation seminar addressing examples of, of how to do commercial translation. Thanks very much, Bob. Those are fantastic insights um, from lived experience. We really appreciate uh, your thoughts there and we're gonna come back to them. Uh, and people should uh, use that Q&A to uh, post some questions that I can pose to the speakers. Our third speaker is Elaine Saunders. Elaine is uh, co-founder of Blamey Saunders Hears, a company which supplies affordable, discreet and highly effective hearing aids through an innovative online telehealth service and clinic based in Melbourne. She's a former chief executive of Dynamic Hearing, a company which supplied uh, award-winning digital signal processing for ultra low power chips for the hearing aid and telephony industry. Elaine has also led the Cooperative Research Centre team that delivered the new electrode for cochlear uh, leading to the company gaining the Australian Design Award in 2000. That's a very short summary because I know Elaine does a lot of other things too, um, but I won't bore people with uh, or take your time, Elaine. I'll introduce you uh, as our third speaker. Well, thank, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, and I should just add one thing to that intro, uh, given all our presence here, which is that Dynamic Hearing was a spin-off from one of the CRCs. Um, I want to take the approach today of looking at solving the problem. And I'll so tell a little bit about myself and how I've approached that path, but I have to say that um, there have been a number of occasions where I have been talking to the CEOs or their teams of global hearing companies, and they've said, how do you manage to do that with only 20 people down there in Australia? Um, <laughs> to which my reply has usually been something along the lines of because we've only got 20, 20 people down here in Australia working on it and we know how to ask the question and pose the problem. Um, and I'll add to that that I did do my spell working in the um, what was then the Bionic Ear Institute. Actually, I'm back there today as a, an honorary clinical research fellow um, but I did my spell working for Graham Clark 
And he gave me the most exceptional job description and position description that I think anyone could ever have. He said, I want you to find out what the problems are, pose the right questions so that the engineers can solve them. I think I did that reasonably well, and it left a lasting impression with me. And I'm told by engineers that I've worked with that they know that when I come in and say, well, this is the problem, and they know that I expect them to solve it. And I have to say, I think that if I get the question right, I don't think I've ever been let down um, by our talented engineers. So I describe myself as, um, uh, I guess I've been an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur for my whole career. Um, some people might say troublemaker. Um, I'm a scientist, an engineer, an entrepreneur, and a clinician. And every one of those has, uh, ha has helped. Uh, the reason I did science was, um, well, maybe I'll say that second. I started in hearing as a 16 year old before university, working as the lowest of the low um, school assistant in a very traditional old fashioned school for deaf children where the children were not allowed to sign at all. They were not allowed to use sign language. The problem is this is before cochlear implants. Hearing aids didn't work very well and they really had no communication. This gave me the view that that was the area that I wanted to work in. Um, I didn't know how. So uh, listening to my dad, like good daughter, he said, well, you better go to the university and get a science degree then. So I did. Um, actually in uh, uh, quantum physics, which is um, perhaps not a direct connection to hearing, but um, it, it worked for me. Over the years I've worked in the hearing area, always trying to solve problems, not quite knowing what was coming next. Uh, and in 2000, we spun a company off dynamic hearing, as I alluded to before, it's myself and Professor Peter Blamey, he and I became 20 year long business partners with two companies. Um, and dynamic hearing supplied signal processing for the world. I'm going to confess here that I forgot to put my watch on at the beginning. Um, <laughs> and we spent a lot of time in the uh, CEO's office or the engineering offices of every hearing aid company around the world. And not just hearing aid companies, uh, consumer headset companies, and there's a good chance that um, your consumer headset has uh, dynamic hearing technologies in it. Um, there were millions and millions sold. We still saw there was a problem, which has been alluded to before, which that people didn't get hearing aids soon enough uh, or didn't necessarily use them well enough. What could we do? So we decided to set up Blamey Saunders Hears, um, which actually we bootstrapped. Um, so in terms of funding, and that's a, another long story. Um, so we wanted to increase accessibility to hearing devices. And we'd want to do that by making it cheaper, easier, more direct, and to address things like how easy they were to handle um, and what they looked like. So we set about to challenge all, all, of, all of that and make it easier. And as a successful company, um, when I say was, it's still running, but it was acquired by Sonova Holdings, one of the world's biggest hearing aid companies in 2019. Um, so my final message is, know what the problem is that you're solving and go out there and solve it. Thanks so much, Elaine. That's uh, really brilliant advice. Um, uh, and and uh, I'm really uh, interested in that aspect of making a, of a, a company problem poser um, <laughs> uh, there. And, <laughs> And there's always that very good quote from Einstein. I'm not sure he ever said it, but uh, it might be one of those ones that's attributed about the, if I only had an hour, I'd, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem mm. uh, and five minutes solving it. And that really rang true. I'm never, it, it comes up in memes quite a lot, but I'm not sure he said it, but it, it rings true. Our fourth speaker is Dig Howard. 
Dig joined Cochlear in 2000 and has a wealth of experience across the company in roles including Chief Operating Officer, Senior Vice President for Manufacturing and Logistics and President Asia Pacific. Prior to joining Cochlear, uh, Dig worked for Boral and Boston Consulting Group. Dig is a member of the Champions of Change Coalition STEM Group and he was appointed as President of Cochlear in 2017 and became CEO and President in 2018. Over to you, Dean. Thanks, Tony, and uh, great to be able to join all of you this afternoon to have this uh, terrific discussion on innovation with a focus on hearing. And I think as you've heard from uh, speakers already today that um, in Australia, we definitely have an ecosystem around hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and Cochlear is part of that ecosystem, but the ecosystem actually existed uh, before Cochlear too. So, it, but it's definitely been an enabler of Cochlear's development. And what I wanted to talk about in my few minutes today was just some of the key um, contributors, key steps to the development of Cochlear from an idea in 1967 to um, a global business today. And the first of those is, is the role of Graham Clark who, and, and the team that he built at the University of Melbourne. So in 1967, Graham set out to uh, see if hearing could be restored um, through electrical stimulation and to understand how hearing worked. He did that development at the University of Melbourne and in 1978 did actually the first prototype uh, implant, which was successful. But the key to getting to that first prototype was absolutely about a multidisciplinary team. And as Elaine said, it was both problem posers and problem solvers. And in restoring a sense, it is a complex problem and it needs therefore both medical um, expertise and academics. Graham was a surgeon, there were audiologists involved, um, other scientists involved, but then also significant engineering and material science to make sure that whatever was built would live in the body, that's the material science part, but then the mechanical and the electrical engineering to actually construct an implant system um, and uh, and then the clinical work to actually follow up and make sure it worked. And there were more involved in that. So a very, very extensive multidisciplinary team. That led to the first prototype, which says proof of concept, this does work. The next phase was the commercialization. And the commercialization, which led to the formation of Cochlear in 1981, was led by um, the Nucleus Group, the Nucleus Group, the uh, entrepreneur and founder of the Nucleus Group was Paul Trainer. And at the time, in, Australia, in the 70s in Australia, the Nucleus Group uh, had one of the world leading pacemakers uh, designed and developed in Australia. A pacemaker is obviously a, a type of uh, implantable stimulator, electronic stimulator. So it had a lot of the core technology in a commercial presence um, that may that uh, con commercial form that enabled the commercialization of Graham Clark's prototype into a commercial offering for Cochlear. So Cochlear actually formed with four people in 1981 in the Nucleus Group. It was very much that expertise, both industrial expertise plus commercial expertise, that led to the development of Cochlear. All through through that process, from uh, the transition from Graham Clark and the latter stage of Graham Clark's development through to the commercialization actually also had federal government support. There were about three or four grants, federal government grants, direct industrialization grants, totaling about four and a half million dollars over the period from about 78 through to, uh, I think it was 82 or 83. So if you multiply that forward to today's numbers, I think that's around about $20 million if you adjust for inflation. So there was pretty significant government support and out of that, uh, Cochlear paid a royalty to uh, both the University of Melbourne and the Australian government for uh, for many years. And so that, that was sort of the steps to commercialisation. They're very importantly in a, a field like cochlear implants, which is a niche. It's quite a small niche uh, business globally. Cochlear had to go global. So it went global very quickly, uh, receiving FDA approval in 1985, so four years after the formation of the company, which if you think about timelines today to develop commercialise and gain approval for, for medical technology is incredible to, to do that in four years. Today, I think people typically would plan on 10 years for, for that sort of cycle. Um, but that globalisation was critical because of the size of the market. And if we now just look at where 
Cochlear is today. Um, we have customers in 180 countries uh, around the world. Uh, physical presence in nearly 40 countries around the world, about 4,400 people uh, across across the world, $1.5 billion in revenue, of which less than 5% comes from in Australia. Uh, however, about 45% of our global employees are in Australia. We still do all our manufacturing in Australia. We do two thirds of our global R&D. Uh, and so while we're very much a global company these days, we are very proudly Australian, but also with a very strong and continuing um, Australian presence. So it's the very quick run through of the, the four steps, which is the academic uh, research idea, prototyping, the commercialization phase with an experienced and capable commercial partner, government support, uh, to take the risk, uh, to take away some of that risk with direct funding and then going global quickly to establish the market. And I, the only thing I didn't mention was Cochlear is very clearly the global leader in implantable hearing solutions today. And Tony, I'll finish up there. I'm glad you got that in at the end, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> we all assume it's still the case, uh, uh, of course, but what an what a incredible story uh, Cochlear is. Um, but as you say, it's only part of the total hearing system in Australia. If you if you suffer from hearing loss, is it best to be an Australian? I, I can start on that one. I think certainly for a, a child born with a severe uh, or profound hearing loss, Australia is the best place, best country to be born. I think it's probably equally true for, for adults. But, uh, Others on this call have more experience across that full portfolio. All right, now we're starting to get some questions and I'll come to them. Uh, all right. The, the um, issue there of, of collaborations come up a few times of the relationships. What does that actually mean? Um, uh, I come from a family of engineers, um, Dig, and um, of course the the definition of uh, of an of a, uh, what is it a extrovert engineer is one that looks at your shoes instead of his own. How do you get scientists and engineers talking to each other? Uh, I, I could, could start on that one. Um, look, I, I think I mean cochlear. It's actually been part of our our history. It's a core part of the culture of the business, and I think that that comes from the university setting. Uh, back and you know, Bob was involved with Graham Clark and Elaine, so they probably have much better insight into how they all work together. But I think that's really carried through now. And, and it's the curiosity of problem solving uh, that, that gets people yeah. talking. I'd like to jump in there if I think if I can be Absolutely. obviously an issue close to my heart. But I actually think if you propose the problem and get the sort of people you want in the room, they won't hold back. People actually enjoy or engineers and scientists are problem solvers and they'll work together and clinicians so if you get the right people in the room with the problem as the center they will solve it i, I think elaine's to... quite right on that tony you know if you think about how we structured each of the crcs it was really to as elaine said identify what were the key problems we needed to address and then have all of the people mm -hmm. the industry partners the scientists and critically the end users who are going to have to implement that technology with children and adults with hearing loss. And, you know, that, that I think was the, that critical thing, posing the problem, but then also having the idea of how are we going to get this out into use? How's it going to work? Yeah. So that issue of how often you, you raise the issue, Bob, of how often do we talk to people, uh, the end users you were reviewing continually, monthly, you said, um, continually. continually. Yeah. Absolutely, continually. That's that's really a, a critical thing, and um, quite quite. A, I think a difference between CRC programs where you, they're more um, industry led, where you know monthly is just a reasonable time to be reviewing projects. Um, you know, uh, six month or a year. I mean, it's gone. <laughs> you know, that's not really uh, appropriate for an industry led collaboration. I think uh, Tony. Demity in in developing bionics now. Are you are you continually talking? How how do yes. you get that problem solving back from 
and the iteration of the R&D. I think that's a really interesting concept. We have many different vehicles, uh, Tony, but the basic thing is, is that when we're having a challenge, um, we accept teams of four and uh, there has to be um, one person, um, a leader from Queensland in the Queensland ones, but it can be from anywhere in the national ones. But um, to accept a team and, and have um, an end user somewhere in that team or as an advisor to that team, I think is really important. Um, the other thing I wanted to go back and say is um, I think that um, it took people a while to understand that the technology, you got the best out of the technology, especially in children, when you um, applied a soft technology, which was the educational program that trained the brains of the children to listen, to understand what the signal that they were hearing meant. It was a new signal and, um, and, and um, taught them how to, to speak with that signal. And I think that the application of that software is something that is not readily apparent to people outside. And um, the hardware and software married, marrying together is what gets the best results. Tony, one other thing that is, is kind of here that I'd really like to introduce into the, is this concept of trust. And long-term collaboration happens and is successful when the partners trust each other. And so that, you know, there, there's not a holding back of, look, that, that's not going to work. We need to do this in a different way. And that trust is what really underpins the longer-term collaboration um, successes, I think it, it's a key element that, that I've seen over the years. I often point to that, Bob, when I'm talking to people in universities, you've got to separate because we have, in a, in a public sense, so much of a focus on grants um, and, and we, we make the mistake of tying people's grant to, you know, tying the people to the project. And of course, if, you, if you've been good on innovation, projects will fail. It doesn't mean the people fail. And if they're, if somebody's, uh, you know, livelihood is pinned to the success of a particular project, they're very reluctant to sort of reinvent it or admit it's not working or that sort of thing. I'm not saying they cheat or whatever, but but it's human nature that you, you cling to it for as long as possible. How, how have you broken that nexus so that people have some sort of assurance of that they can volunteer and tr uh, trust that they'll still be supported. Can I put in a word there for this for the, uh, uh, the spin-off? Away, away you go. <laughs> um, no, no, I just wanted to put in a word for the spin-off. And again, uh, Bob and I worked there together in the past, but um, one way of keeping those teams and keeping them really, really motivated and focused is, of course, a spin-off. Um, the, the background I have here is from my company now, Bingara. That's what we do. We help people spin off, scale up, whatever, just to kind of get stuff out there in teams that really, really work. That's a fantastic comment. Bob, you were agreeing? Uh, yeah, I think absolutely. It, uh, you know, the, um, the experience of, of spinning off dynamic hearing and then just seeing where Elaine and Peter took that company was was quite astounding to me it was uh it was a steep learning curve for us all venture capital funding is a, was a whole new area of learning that had to be uh, acquired and um you know i i often stand in awe of uh, the amount of time elaine has spent on planes um, <laughs> and in offices but you know she, she very deserved success this this trust issue though what you need to come back to, and one of the things I often said to my project leaders when they came in and, and would say, look, this isn't working, um, was to say, well, good, then we can eliminate that as an option, and where do we go now? Hmm. So failing, uh, a project failing isn't, isn't a bad thing. It's narrowing down the options for success. Yeah, fantastic. Um Paul Wood has posed in the Q&A, um, why do so many people talk about how poorly Australia commercialises our technology? It, and I, I, I'll, I'll introduce you by saying, when you do a Churchill Fellowship and go and ask every other country how they do it, they all, every, every country says this about themselves. Uh, but I, 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 I think... Know, yeah. Yeah. Look, I think there's two parts. So clearly, Australia does commercialise technology and commercialise technology successfully. There's a number of good examples. However, if you go and look at global innovation index rankings, 
um, there you can sort of you can draw a line from Australia on research being I think inside the top 10 I think down now into the 30s on um, around the commercialization so so clearly we are doing relative well we do commercialize relative to the quality of the research we do we don't commercialize at that level and I think that's that that's the aspiration is not let's bring our research down um, let's lift our commercialization up to the level of, of the research that's done in the country and um, you're on a number of government panels I think so if you if you were the king for a day what would, what would be your top one or two things you'd do if you had total control yeah, no, I, I'm involved in with the government. I mean, the government sees this and does want to make a difference, which, which I think is, is fantastic. And uh, one of the things we talk about on these panels is this is not a new problem. The, the, the grants that Cochlear got 40 years ago were part of the government saying, gee, we should be better at commercialising things in Australia. Uh, how, how can we do it? So uh, I, do, I do think there's very clearly a role for government. Uh, and, and I do think that direct government grants are very important at critical risk stages in, in, in programs. And that's typically sort of the TRL4 to TRL6 level. You get a bit bit technical. That's where technical, the sort of the, comes read, out. readiness levels. Yes. Yes. Comes out of research, starting to get in prototype commercialization. That's where the, there's failure. Uh, so I think there's an important role there. And I do think as we talked about, and it's a hard one, is that collaboration. It's how to get commercial people, technical people, scientists talking together, understanding the end need, and then solving the problem collectively to, to, to get there. Uh, and I think that's um, it's that hard, difficult problem solving, uh, which is multi multidisciplinary as it was in the Cochrane plant, Yeah, you've just um, you've just frozen. So we'll uh, I'll pose the question that uh, I think it's James has asked. Uh, given the nature of potential trade issues with China, do you see Australia as a feasible site to mass manufacturing here in technologies, given our incredible global le legacy? Dimity, you're trying to build that in in a in a whole new area. Um, what's your feeling on um, manufacturing in Australia? Um, I, I found that I really needed to go offshore to start with because I had the opportunity mostly, um, but um, it was something that I really did get caught over. I was lucky that I was working with a technician who spoke both Cantonese and um, Mandarin, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't speak to either of those. So there was always a double translation in the middle. And, uh, and plus when COVID came in, of course, things really stopped for about a year and a half. And there's only just starting, I'm only just getting promise of another prototype. Um, so I, I don't know whether that's continuable or whether I should be looking for a manufacturer here in Australia and just move on with it. Can I jump in there? Uh, absolutely, Elaine. Well, Blamey Saunders hearing aids were manufactured in Australia. I mean, now they have different donors, so it's different uh, pathway. Um, I, we set out absolutely determined that they will be made in Australia. Um, I have to say it was a challenge. Um, and part of the thing reason is because there are supporting technologies that we don't have in the manufacturing space. And if I can add a, a trivial one, which may well have changed by now, but was the case three years ago, one is um, actually painting tiny things um, <laughs> <laughs> or little things. We're very good at very tiny things. And I, I'm involved in ANFF, so we're very, very good at tiny things. We're quite good at big things, but we don't have much in the middle with little things. And we don't have the components here. We don't have the supply chain. So it, at the moment, I mean, I would, it, it is tough. Yeah. Um, we would probably have had a much easier life and certainly lower cost of goods if we had worked overseas. I'd add that I I should have said I'm an investor in a hearing technology, Neura, which is uh, again out of Melbourne University people mm. uh, and that we manufacture in China, but the, the, the uh, founder always says it's to access the manufacturing skills there. Mm. Um, which yeah. we don't have here, we do the, everything else in Australia. 
Dig, how have you been able to maintain such a high level of manufacturing in Australia? Yeah, and, and sorry, Tim, my internet just dropped out, so I'm back out and <laughs> Out and back in. Um, look, I, I think, um, I mean, first of all, we've got a high value niche product, uh, but we do think if we look around, we think we're the, mo the lowest cost manufacturer in the world now too, based in Australia. And, and a lot of that comes from the very, and the, and the huge value to us is the very tight integration between manufacturing and engineering. And, and that linkage helps us make sure that we've got the, the very best quality products, but it also enables us to get better and better at making them and, and uh, lowering costs. So there's a, there's a huge experienced curve and we're way down that curve because we've continued to invest in the same place with the same people over a very long period of time. And Tony, there's a key element here in terms of, you know, just reflecting on um, IP development and patent development. Um, I reflect on some of the technology that we've licensed to, to Cochlear and, you know, the first iterations that the engineers brought to me when I would review that patent, I would go, okay, yes, I can see that the concept works, but it needs to work twice as fast and use a third of the power in order to be implementable in a device. So it's that connection of, of, yes, this is a good idea, but how do we actually make it, you know, feasible to implement in a device? That's a, a, a key step in, in the commercialization pathway. Oh, I'm going to stick with you, Bob, because Sar I think it's Sarji. Um, obviously, my glasses need renewal. I'm having trouble reading uh, people's names in bold there. When multiple parties come together to create a new product, how does one manage the, the question about who owns the IP? And I just thought, you mentioned licensing. Uh, so the ownership issue, um, talk to us about that. Uh, Tony, look, I think so many projects have trouble because people focus on who owns something rather than on who has use rights. Uh, and if people would focus more on who has the application rights to something, that's then leading you to who's going to use it, how is it going to reach the end user, I mean, it really doesn't matter who owns the IP if you can't actually get it out to the end user. Um, you know, so I, I think the focus should not be on who, how, who owns something. It's more on who is going to have the rights to apply and use that technology. That's more key. And, you know, Elaine, you, you and Dig might have a, a, pr a perspective on that as well. You now advise in this area all the time, Elaine. <laughs> Oh, no, I just, uh, I think that, uh, I thought that was a very good way of putting it, actually. I mean, I spend, either through Bingara or personally, a massive amount of time with um, small companies, spin-offs, individuals, people trying to scale. And that that is the key question. And usually you have to start right back there and say, well, okay, it's a great idea for a patent, but what do you actually want to do? Yep. So I think you put it very well there, Bob, actually. So, and Dig, you were, you were uh, nodding your head madly on the ownership issue. Oh, we've just lost it. Um, <laughs> it's wrong. Brilliant hearing, but bad uh, internet um, connections uh, just today uh, with everyone home. Um, what are some of the other areas uh, like hearing where, which are examples where Australia's uh, leading in commercialization of our science? Um, probably inappropriate to put that to a hearing panel, but uh, Dimity, you're trying to take that hearing expertise and put it into limbs and things. And Elaine, you're working similar. How much similarity is there once you can do it in one field to transfer that knowledge and use it in another? I can't see the direct path yet, Tony. I, I'm still learning um, about that actual commercialization process. I, I see bits of it. And I, um, we at Bionics Queensland run courses in it, but I never get a chance to sit in on them. So um, I, I really do need to go and do a whole end-to-end -end study of it. I'm not sure where and how. Bob, you might have some ideas on that. Um, and I'm going to go to Elaine now and then give well, I, I guess I think it's an overly broad word. I mean, I tend to break it down and say, you know, what do we actually want to do here? We actually want to... Um, make products and sell them and build a business. Well, if so, let's think about it from that perspective. So I think the word commercialize has a few flaws and it's kind of too big and too nondescript. Um, in, you've got to have a goal. 
there was a terrific talk I heard recently by a local entrepreneur uh, in, in Woodend, she's from Castlemaine. She was talking about rural entrepreneurship. She was not talking about technology. She was talking about people who were doing lamb bacon or um, camel milk. But she spent a lot of time looking at entrepreneurs and having that vision and that drive. And I think there is no way that um, Dynamic Hearing or Jamie Saunders would have got anywhere if it wasn't for the fact that uh, its founders were absolutely, absolutely determined it was going to succeed. Um, and that did in fact involve a lot of personal cost, really. But that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to solve those problems. So I'm not sure commercialization is the right word. It, it's a translation might even be be better because then that's step one. Step two is, well, where are we going with it? When I when I visit you, Bob, in Melbourne, or I used to in my old job, uh, I love walking up up and down uh, Swanson Street in Melbourne because it's not just you. Uh, the the dental CRC was up the road, the the oral health one, and that manufacture that uh, involved in manufacturing excellent products. How important is it? around a university, of course, uh, CSL's just nearby and a whole whole heap of uh, IBM lab things that work around a university. Do you think we're getting better at that ecosystem of, of innovation? I think universities are trying to do this. Um, they're looking at cross-sector collaborations. I know at the University of Melbourne, we have a number of new hubs or research hubs that have been set up that purposefully go cross sectors and, um, you know, bring in different perspectives, um, which I think is, is really important. I mean, Elaine, is, as I think I agree very much with the use of the word translation. And if you want to think, it, it's sort of the end of the circle where mm -hmm. Elaine has talked about what's the first thing we need to do. We need to work out what's the problem, um, because the problem identifies who needs to use this at the end. And then translation is about how do we ensure that they get to use it? Now that might mean we have to have a, uh, an industry partner in the middle to manufacture something or for something uh, like example, a service for the Hear and Say Center, it might just be uh, informing clinicians about it. And that was one of the reasons we set up HearNet Learning as a continuing professional development program in order to be able to tell people because if they don't know about it, they can't use it. So, you know, there's this issue about lots and lots of research is done. I mean, if you look at the number of papers coming out, but how many of them actually get read by the people? So I think one of the missing things um, is about communicating outcomes to the to the end users, the clinicians who who need to use that technology, or even the end users, the 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 people with hearing loss. That's one of the good things that Blamey and Saunders did was to you know get out to those end users, um, rather than just have you know that information to the clinicians. So translation is probably a good word. Can I add something very trivial to Bob's comment there that we did indeed, he's right, we kept very, very close to our end users, very close through forums, design. But I asked one of, I uh, did a little bit of a survey around our end users and said, what do you like most about Blamey Saunders? And they said, the Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, we, but that was quite telling in that we invited our customers, hearing aid users, to a Christmas party, which is actually not very common in the industry. <laughs> Uh, Dig, I won't ask about Cochlear's Christmas party. <laughs> oh, sure, brilliant. But uh, I want to go back to you on that manufacturing step uh, comment yes. because I, I know you, you got cut off uh, by your internet there. But I also want to ask you to keep going on about the, the issue of translation of research. Mm -hmm. I, I actually prefer thought about more of a circle or an iterative thing than if we say translation, very often that means from a a university to a company and it's not no, 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 it's no, not no. really work that way circle yeah no yeah yeah look i, I think um I completely agree it is a it is a circle and it is back and forth and i think you know we, we talked about there being an ecosystem for hearing in, in australia um and it, how that ecosystems work is this constant feedback Yes. Um, and, and you know constant regeneration of ideas and new ideas and building on the evidence um, and that is both 
in inside business and in academia and doing that jointly. So I think, yeah, it's not a, a handover point and then it disappears and it's never seen again. Um, it, it works that way. You know, Cochlear at the moment has around about 100 research partnerships with uh, around the world, um, many of those in Australia, but, but globally, and that is all part of continuing to develop understanding um, of hearing and how it can be improved and uh, our products and clinical outcomes. I've got a couple of questions that are essentially asking, can they send their CV to you? Um, do you have any new students entering the R&D field of hearing we, implants? We, I, I like we to hear that you're still do. growing. <laughs> yeah, we do. We have quite an extensive um, uh, graduate program for, for engineers we, and we get um, thousands of applications, actually, which is just fantastic. Um, but we also bring, it, uh, bring engineers and scientists in at uh, all levels through the careers. Yes, we're definitely uh, always hiring and looking. Um, well, Look at our website, it. check our website. <laughs> so, um, I'm not gonna put Dick's personal email up. Uh, you need to go through the website, okay? Um, but there, there are a number of questions there um, on jobs. We're coming to uh, uh, the end of our hour together. I might just run very quickly around the, the um, uh, panel and ask, is there one point you really think we should emphasize uh, in, uh, in this whole area of whether we call it translation? I like to think of it as just a way of making a difference with our knowledge. Um, Bob, I'm gonna go to you first. Look, I think the the one of the key messages has been this this the sick the cycle, the cycle from from problem through to end user, and and how that addresses key problems. And I noted in the chat, someone brought up a really key issue about tinnitus, um, and tinnitus coming from very early on and hearing uh, in in even mild hearing loss. And this just to me raises the whole issue that. Um, we've talked about hearing technology, but we really should be including hearing loss prevention on the front end of that. Um, and I'd like certainly like to see more emphasis on prevention of hearing loss um, in addition to remediation. Sorry, it's my little orange crate. <laughs> what, what do you think we should emphasize? I'd like to see more, um, of, more facilities for people to manufacture um, in Australia onshore and, um, and, and people who have um, specific expertise in particular areas that um, we can refer people to. Elaine. Um, I'm tempted to say my uh, comments have already been made, but I particularly support uh, Demetri's comment there. Um, I still think we have to focus on what problems need to be solved and keep very alert to the enabling technologies. And I'm kind of intrigued that nobody in the chat has brought up something that um, is clearly in the air, so to speak, and that's the issue of therapeutics. Um, so I think that uh, we have to keep a very open mind to what's available and how we integrate it, how we use it. Dig, you're going to get the last word on what do we need to uh, emphasise? I, I think... Firstly, we should be optimistic. We should believe in what what we can do and what we're mm. capable of, um, and recognizing that I think we you know, these difficult problems get solved by by teams, by multidisciplinary mm. teams. That it's uh, and that's where that collaboration bit comes in. It's not a, a single point solution from a single very rarely a single point solution from a single person. It's a, it's a team. Team things. Well, uh, thank you to all our speakers today and thank you to the audience, um, most of whom have stayed online, which is always a good indicator um, uh, in a lunchtime se seminar. Um, thank you to ATSI. The next webinar in this series will focus on sustainability and it'll be at the same time on uh, for Friday the 29th of October. Uh, the link to register is in the chat. And I'd encourage you to do that because there's some fantastic stories uh, there. I, um, I've helped put the panel together there and I'll facilitate again. And I know if, you, if you've been had uh, carbon capture and storage dismissed, um, there's somebody who wants to argue with you. Another person will be uh, capturing carbon but turning it into brand new building materials and are doing that 
uh, right right now here it's not a theory it's a it's a practical thing so again thank you uh, make sure you follow atsi on social media uh, to hear about our other webinars and the events coming up there's a lot that are happening because of the um, uh, the pandemic one of the uh, lack of uh, of um, local events uh, from ATSI fellows is that we're doing far more uh, national events and there it's a great to learn from each other um, and uh, and to leave our lockdown for a few minutes at least uh, through a, uh, through an hour listening to others I've, I've learned a lot today um, I always want to say um, I've interviewed Bob on radio a few times and the, the, the issues that really come to me that in hearing is that um, People don't seek help for hearing loss nearly as quickly as they do for sight. Uh, none of us are embarrassed to go for a go in and get a, a t test for our eyes, and I obviously need it, a renewal. Um, but don't ever be embarrassed and encourage others to go in and get a hearing test. They're now becoming more affordable and quicker and easier. Um, and uh, I, I understand the delay can be up to about eight years before people help uh, seek help and you don't need to suffer um, and, and you should absolutely um, seek help. And finally, the other um, bit of thing I always say to the politicians here in Canberra is that more than half of hearing aids on earth contain Australian technology. Uh, so isn't that good that in one, in one ear they're getting an Australian accent all around the world? So with that, we'll finish and thank our speakers again uh, it's been a terrific hour.